Hello and welcome uh, to the uh, Better Buying, um, uh, sorry, Better Bull Buying webinar series uh, running through March. I'm Martin Pruce. I'm the uh, Livestock Officer for the uh, Riverina Local Land Services based here at Wagga Wagga. Thanks for joining uh, today's um, uh, webinar. As I say, this is a second of a series of three that we're having. Um, the first one was held back on the 9th of March with uh, Katrina Millen, the Technical Officer for Southern Beef Technology Services. Um, it was talking about the um, uh, making better, uh, making bull selection decisions for heifer matings and, and really sort of talking about the curve bender rule of getting the high genetic uh, capability bulls to, um, to join over heifers, uh, hopefully to get a slightly smaller uh, progeny being produced for ease of calving. But, Today, um, uh, as I say, it's the second series, the second webinar of the series, uh, where we have uh, uh, Dr. Brad Ramsley from um, where we have Dr. Brad Ramsley from the research scientists uh, with the Extensions Livestock Thing Industries. Um, Animal Genetics and Breeding Unit um, with the Livestock Industry Centre at DPI at Armidale. But firstly, um, I'd just like to uh, to acknowledge the Radri people who are the traditional custodians of the land. I would also like to pay respects to both elders past and present of the Radri nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians uh, that could be present. And again, the this uh, series of, of workshops is um, uh, is, is in uh, partnership with Southern Beef Technology Services, New South Wales DPI, Animal Genetics and Breeding Unit, and the Holbrook Veterinary Centre, Production and Breeding Services. So the Riverine Local Land Service is proud to host these series of webinars. Um, ag again, and it's, it's been a great opportunity to, to provide this information. It'll hopefully uh, provide a few answers um, on, again, when selecting bulls or selecting um, you know, for, for that commercial or whether it's a study deposit, certainly more for the commercial breeders to what breed is the, um, or what again, what genetics, what opportunity you're looking for, which is going to fit your program the best. So hopefully to answer these questions today, following on from the event on the 9th of March, uh, yeah, I'd like to welcome Brad Ramsley um, from the Animal Genetics and Breeding Unit uh, at Armidale. So Brad is responsible for the R&D in breeding objectives and selection indexes for beef cattle, including the continued development and support of industry application of the breed objectives technology. Brad is a principal investigator in the New South Wales DPI flagship Southern Multi-Breed Project, uh, presently conducted across New South Wales DPI research stations. Um, and I think one feedlot, Brad, that's involved with that as well. And that's being run between 2020 until 2025. Brad originates from Glen Innes and is the fourth generation grazier uh, involved in a family operation primarily focused on beef production. Welcome, Brad, and I'd like to hand over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Have you got your mic on there, Brad? Yep, thanks Martin. I just had to organise my screens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Before I begin, thank you for the invitation to present an update on the Southern Multibreed Project. As you've indicated, it's a major research effort by New South Wales DPI, but also in association with our uh, research partners, the University of New England here, oops, sorry, and the MA Donor Company. Um, also... Excuse me, Brett. Sorry, just interrupt. <laughs> Not the appropriate thing to do. Uh, just pretty good start. I just wanted to, sorry, just in the intro, I just forgot to mention to people that attendees are muted, but they do have the opportunity to ask questions during the, uh, via the chat channel that's on the uh, on the menu bar on the right hand side of the screen. And um, the presentation will go for probably 45 minutes, but if you've got any questions, please put them in. And um, we might break for a couple of intervals uh, throughout the presentation to answer any questions as quickly and randomly as they as they come in. Thanks again, Brad. Continue. Thanks. No worries. Thanks, Martin. Um, so today I'm just going to present an update of that flagship project, the Southern Multibreed Project. Um, to do that, I'm going to focus on four areas, which are what is the rationale for the project, how we've designed the project, 
where we're currently up to and what are the commercial benefits that will come out of it for producers. At each of these points, when I'm finished these, I'll stop, as Martin said, to allow um, people to ask questions if they want to at that point. So let's begin with the background and why we're conducting the project. Um, when we're selecting bulls at sale, um, it's very hard to determine the potential of that bull, particularly if something like carcass value differences of its progenies. Um, some work that's been conducted by Angus Australia over the last 10 years, their Angus Sci benchmarking program has shown some results that are quite interesting and that they've published them on Beef Central as I've got down here. Um, but their best and worst carcasses in, in a given year in that project have a difference of $2,076 between those two carcasses. When you average that back to sire averages of, of carcasses, um, the difference between the best and worst sire is $619 in this particular example that they demonstrated. That just goes to show that there are differences there that we can't see visually and that, there, that there's a justification for having genetic evaluations to allow us to um, determine those differences in the, in the abattoir and, and they're quite clearly evidently here in this information. So when we're selecting bulls, you know, how do we do it visually for yield, carcass quality, for other things? We've obviously got to measure them and come up with genetic parameters, which is where EBVs come in. As another example, in the north, my colleague here in the Animal Genetics and Breeding Unit, David Johnston, is running a project called the Reproonomics Project where they're doing multi-breed for the northern breeds. Um, and just some examples for fertility from him. For the best and worst Brahma bulls in that project, they have a difference of 20 days in their in their days to calving EBV. But on the ground measurements, puberty, the best and worst bulls, which is not necessarily those two bulls in the pictures, but the best and worst bulls in that project, there's an 8.9 months difference in the average age of puberty of their heifers. So that means one bull's heifers are nearly a year earlier reaching puberty than the other bulls. And when those females that do go in calf recycle following their first calf, the best and worst bull in that project is about four and a half months difference between them. So that, that has a, a very large impact on the potential to go back in calf and remain in the herd by producing a calf every year. So again, there's evidence in research that's being done around differences for fertility. Um, and when we're selecting bulls, there's a need to, to separate what we see, because what we see is the performance. So visually we see that performance or we measure it in an abattoir or measure it through measurements like fertility. That's a function of the genetics and the environment combining together. But what we need to do is remove the environmental part from that performance, which is things around differences in age, differences in management, nutrition, health impacts, and, and the age of their mother can have an influence on certain traits. And by doing that, that allows us to get at the point of what's coming from the sire and what's coming from the dam. And this part is what we predict in breed plan as the EBV, and that's the genetic component that we can breed for moving forward. Our objective through the genetic evaluation is to allow people to improve their profitability. And that can be done through innovation on farm, which helps the management, but the EBVs allow us to do selection for the traits that are economically important. And it's when we do those two together, the selection and the innovation, first of all, we predict the EBVs with high accuracy and then we use them properly and use innovation on our production systems to manage the animals well, we can make good gains in profitability in the production system. Um, so when we come to, this is obviously an old side, picking bulls for last year or picking bulls for this year based on our EBVs, you know, how do we do that? Well, within the industry, we're pretty well averse within each breed that we've got a genetic evaluation that can allow us to pick bulls differences. What we don't have is how do we evaluate the differences between breeds? We don't have that in Australia, or we really don't have that anywhere in a really effective manner. Um, what we do have, this is the best that we have currently, and this is a comparison between the breeds in the table that you can see there, Angus Brahm and Charlotte Hereford and Shorthorn. Currently what we have is a conversion table that was published in 2004, and all it does is allow us to convert Angus and Hereford. We don't have any other information on the other breeds that are in the table there. That means we also don't have any information on how those breeds compare for profitability. So the aim of this project is, is to change those crosses to ticks and be able to compare between the breeds. Um, another aspect of this project is 
is focusing on fertility. I, I touched on some northern stuff, but is it really a problem of the north? Is, is it something that we should be focused here on the south? And just to put that question forward, I've got a table here. This is not research results. This is anecdotal results coming out of the 2019 drought. So pregnancy tests of 2020, these females were all mated in the 2019 drought. And you can see here that there's a large diversity in um, percent pregnancies between the different herds and, and mobs within a herd. Um, so that's showing that there's definitely concern, particularly with weaning ra uh, pregnancy rates like this and this that are, are, are far below profitable. But what it also shows is there's genetic variation. So within the same mob that's had the same environment and the same bulls, some of those females are going in calf and some aren't. So there's definitely variation within that. So it's an issue we need to be thinking about in the south as well, given that we've got predictions of climate impacts on our production system in the south, and we need to be in front of the game and addressing that as we move forward. Some other things, currently in breed plan, our main fertility trade is days to calving. It's lowly heritable, less than 10%. So we don't aren't able to make very much gain, and if we're not recording it well, we're even less likely to make genetic gain. Um, there's some other new, more precise traits, such as puberty and lactational anestrus, or that's the ability to recycle after the first calf, and they've got higher heritabilities, which means if we can record those traits, we've got the potential to make greater genetic gains and improve fertility overall. In some other work conducted by another ag colleague, Matt Wolcott, in Hereford and Angus seed stock herds across southern Australia, he was scanning, scanning ovaries and determining heifer puberty age at puberty. In that work, when all those heifers from those seed stocks were synchronised to go into AI programs to begin their reproductive life, only about 50% of the heifers in those herds were actually pubertal going into that synchronisation, which means if you transferred that to a commercial context, only about 50% of the heifers would be actually cycling when the bull went in the paddock. And ideally what we want to do is give the heifers at least one, if not two cycles before we expose them to the bull before they have their first conception. So, you know, it raises the question, is there an effect of the way we're using breeding technologies in reproduction in Southern Australia? Is, is it impacting our ability for females to express fertility? Um, this is work, this project is looking into that work and hopefully we can provide some answers on that. The other aspect to this is uh, given we've moved into the wide scale use of genomics in, in most species, is we want to take DNA samples for all the animals that are within that project that allow us to create a genomic reference on all the traits we record and all the breeds we record within the project. So to just summarise that in three points, one aim of the project is, is to create the uh, record the data to allow crossbreed head-to-head -head comparisons to, to be available to underpin a temperate multibreed evaluation. Um, we also want to use this multibreed herd as a resource population to record hard to, hard to measure traits such as fertility or carcass traits or, or feed efficiency or methane or any, any other new traits that, that become economically important. And the third one, as I said, is to make sure that we genotype all the animals across this project so that their information can be um, utilised through the genomics that's now within breed plan to create a multi-breed genomic evaluation. Um, Martin, we can stop there if, if there are any questions from the audience at that point around the rationale as to why the project was developed and executed. Uh, thanks, Brad. Um, I'm just having a bit of difficulty seeing the questions. Um, Lark, now can you help there? It's uh, I think there was one that came in, Brad, uh, about um, with the snapshot you had there before uh, of the pregnancy uh, percentages of, of the joined cows. Those are yep. sort of down, yeah, you know, sort of 40, 50 percent or below. Um, yep. What age? What age? If they, uh, yes, mixed. what age was the mm, mixed age? Mi mm. Mixed ages. So there's there's mobs of cow mature cows. There's there's mobs of heifers. Um, it's, it's mixed. It's not a scientific data set, so it shouldn't be taken as a research information, but it's just anecdotal of what was – it was actually recorded up here on the northern tablelands during the 2019 drought. So it's just some anecdotal evidence that um, there are issues when the environment starts to go against us in the south around reproduction. Yeah, 
Part of it's management, of course. Some of those herds and mobs might not have been managed properly, but there's definitely genetic variation in there as well. Yeah, and again, that was sort of back through the 2019 drought sort of joining period, yeah, which yep. um, I'm assuming would have had major effects yeah, with heat and lack of feed. Yep. It's, um, Correct. But yep. I think one of the key things there is there is variation within herd and within mob. You know, there, there are actually some females, even given that environment, that are cycling and going in calf. So, so that's an important point from that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Luckner, can you see anything coming through there on the chat? It's, um, oh. Nothing yet. Nothing? Okay. Thanks, Brad. All right. Well, we'll keep going then, if that's all right. Thank you. All right. So we'll, we'll get to the design. So this is quite a large, complex project. Um, it's based across five major geographical regions across New South Wales. Starting in the south, down at Menangle or in southwestern Sydney, just before you you duck over the hills to to the Southern Highlands, um, we've got Tokal in the Hunter Valley, Trangi out on the Western Plains, Glenninus here on the Northern Tablelands, and Grafton and its Northern Cluster Research Stations, which are up near Wollombar, the the former uh, a subtropical environment where the animals are run. Um, those environments have been purposely selected to create diversity in the production system. I've just got some photos here to show that. The top photo here is some Wagyu cows that are out at Trangi in, I think it was December 2020, um, and pretty pretty much the same day at Grafton. These are the, the cows, the Bosinicus and the Hereford Angus cows that are at Grafton in the tropical pastures. So, so you can see there's some diversity geographically. We, we've also gone for diversity in, in the time horizon. So this is Glen Ennis on the Northern Tablelands in March and April of, of 2020. You can see these females are grazing a pretty good turnip crop there. This is then those same females when they're starting to carve the first calves into the Southern Multibreed Project um, in 2020. And you can see that's the middle of July. It's well frosted. The temperate grasses aren't growing and, and, and it's pretty cold and, and miserable at that time. So we've both got geographical diversity there within the project and we've got temporal or timeline diversity given the production systems change. Um, I haven't got a photo but Trangi in the middle of July, August can can look sensational but then December when the heat comes on it, it looks like that photo there. Um, so to continue on the design, we, we're dealing with a constrained resource in the, the land we had available to run multi-breed, which means that we had to had to base our decisions on breed representation within the industry and the impact that any particular breed actually has on the industry. And so our process was, process was we selected the highest represented southern breeds and added Brahman to that so that we could um, have comparisons to the Northern Reaponomics project, where, which includes Brahman Santa's and drought master. So we brought Brahmins into this project. And they're also commercially relevant on the, the north coast of New South Wales in that subtropical environment. Um, so here's what we've got. We've got Angus, Charolais, Hereford, Shorthorn, Wagyu as our five biggest impactful breeds in southern Australia. And we've got our Brahmin as our link to the north and also relevant on that north coast location. Um, Within the project, we conduct predominantly purebred matings. I have got a little asterisk here. Um, those purebred matings are designed to produce purebred calves, except on the north coast, we have a little element of crossbreeding where we're mating Brahmin bulls to Hereford and Angus cows, and we're mating Hereford and Angus bulls back to Brahmin cows in reciprocal crosses. That's for a few reasons. We need to understand what's what's going on with some of the crossbreeding, but also more importantly, that is commercially relevant to get traction on the ground in the in the North Coast, we've done that crossing. Um, when we run this project, we produce progeny that are comparable, that steers that are comparable through their lifetime, after weaning, through backgrounding, through the feedlot, through the carcass, and whenever we're measuring efficiency. The heifers are also run together so that all their traits, their growth traits, their reproduction traits, their maternal traits are all comparable. Across, across their lifetime. So that's one of the key elements that the breeds are, are run head to head, managed head to head. The only time they're not done that way is the small window when we make them while we're doing pure, pure breeding. So other than that, for the rest of the 10 months of the year, they're, 
they run head to head across breeds. And you can see that here. We've got Grafton where we've got our Hereford Angus and Brahmin cows all run together. Glen Ennis, this is the Angus, Hereford and Wagyu cows. I showed you that turnip photo earlier. This is EMAI where we've got five breeds. We've got Angus, Hereford, Wagyu, Shorthorn and Charolais all run there in a multi-breed group and they're all represented in that photo you can see there. And this is out at Trangy where we've got Angus, Hereford and Wagyu at the moment and we're looking to introduce some um, Shorthorn and Charolais to Trangy moving forward into the future too. Um, as Martin said, the project's a five-year project, started in the middle of 2020, set to run to the middle of 2025. When we're designing the mating program, it's allocated individual matings. We don't mate the best bull to the best cows and we don't do corrective mating. We do matings to, to get representation of the size and also the maternal lines that are there, so we allocate individual matings. We also um, focus on avoiding inbreeding because inbreeding has an influence on fertility it's detrimental to fertility so to try and get the best gauge of true fertility we try to avoid inbreeding in all the matings we do that's tricky in some instances but we've got systems to get around that and when we manage them whether that's as a cow herd or a group of heifers or the steers in the feedlot or during backgrounding we operate in an all-in and all-out mentality. That means within a, a group of animals, they all get managed the same. We don't do any culling as conventionally would occur um, in commercial systems unless it's for certain reasons, like a cow has gone completely lame and therefore she wouldn't be able to put full capacity back into her next calf or, you know, a cancer-eye cow becomes a danger to the staff, things like that. We, we, we remove them for those reasons, but we don't cull on type or other, other reasons and we don't draft. We, when the steers go into the feedlot, they go in as a group, they come out as a group, they're killed as a group. We don't do any selective drafting based on weight or anything else so that we avoid it. biasing the data. We want to do full comparison of the variation that's they're both within and between the breeds. So that's another very important aspect of what we do. Um, that's just one of the measurements we take there. That's a an ovary and you can see there, that's the corpus luteum we're looking for to indicate that a female is either pubertal or she's gone back to recycling after that calving. So some of the traits that we um, record, we, we record all the breed plan traits, which is in this, this table here. These are conventional traits put out by various breed organisations as part of breed plan. So they're, they're pretty much conventional. We also record, record new traits. We've got new reproduction traits such as our, our heifer puberty and our um, recycle trait. We've got cow composition going into mating, so body condition score or scan measurements. We're assessing horn, pole and skur phenotypes in, in all the breeds across the project to try and improve the horn, pole tests. Uh, we're looking at car figure, resilience, adaption, and there's some other other um, projects that are working in collaboration with us around methane measurement of, of the steers and heifers, the steers in the feedlot and the heifers in the paddock, and some other things like immune confidence with uh, CSIRO, which I'll, I'll, I'll go to here. So these, I, I've touched on these, our, our new reproduction traits, age of puberty of the heifers and the uh, recycling trait. Key element is all those traits are recorded with the heifers in the same environment. This is the scanning process here, conducted, being conducted there in the north. This is what an ovary looks like, and this is the corpus to a team that we're looking for to, to indicate that cycling is occurring. Um, cow body condition score, my colleague Matt Wilcott here. He's scanning with an ultrasound scanner, EMA, P8 and rib fat, as you would in a, a young growing animal. He's also assessing body condition score, and that's being done at both mating and weaning of the heifers and then when they become a first calf and a second calf cow. Um, another Agbu colleague here, Natalie Connors, she's recording the horn pole and skur phenotypes, the size and type of the horns and skurs, plus it's being recorded across the lifetime of, of the animals to, to assess what happens as, as the animals grow across time and if they start to develop horns later in life. Um, just a point there, the bruising caused by horns in the industry is about a $30 million deduction per year in the Australian beef industry, so it's something we um, need to look at. That's even before we get to the animal welfare problems when it comes to actually dehorning animals. Um, and one of our collaborators, CSIRO, they've, they're conducting immune competence testing, which involves a five-in-one challenge. 
and, and seeing what the response is while the calf's being weaned, while it's under the stress of weaning. Um, again, Martin, if there's any questions at that point, it's a good time to, to ask them now if, if people want to. No questions yet, Brad. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, I'll just keep moving right. then, if that's all right. Oh, sorry, Brad, Martin. Yeah, no problem. Just got one for you. Mentioning the, um, uh, again, sort of brought up is the PEF of puberty and you know, the impact of age there, but also yep. body condition scores. Sort of, the, I know from you know, probably my background more in the uh, the sheep industry rather than the cattle industry, but yeah, you know, there's mm -hmm. there's often a very close coincidence between you know age, puberty, um, and condition scoring for joining of um, you know of of, of weaner sheep or or or, or maiden ewes. How's yep. similar thing? Um, what are you finding there with a, a, a correlation back to uh, heifers? It's it's uh, yeah that lighter score you get, you're finding a um a, you know, a lower uh, conception rate. It's um... well, we haven't actually done any comparisons yet on that because the heifers are only just as we'll see in a minute. The heifers are only just gone in calf, so so we haven't actually got an, a numbers to start to do any definitive comparisons. But it is something that we'll be doing moving into the future and. In particular, we'll be focused on what is the relationship between body condition score, her ability to go back in calf, and her remaining in the herd um, when after they've calved. Like at that point after calving, when they're trying to recycle, retract the uterus, lactate, go back in calf, all those things competing at the same time for the nutritional resource. That's the one we're really focused on, and we'll, we'll, as we move forward, we'll see We'll see where we get to. So September, October, November this year, we'll be redoing the first level of recording at that mating point. We're actually doing the um, the what would be the weaning one, even though the heifers haven't weaned a calf, the cows in the herd are weaning. So we're currently doing that now. We've, we've done one site and we've got another four sites to record as we're moving forward from here. So, so we're not quite in a point to answer any of those questions, but, you know, give us six months or 12 months and we will be, Martin. No, uh, thank, thanks for that, uh, Brad. Yep, no problems. I've dropped the gunner before you. Thank you. No worries. No worries. All right. I'm assuming I'm right to continue. Yep. All right. So I'll just show you where we're up to in the project at the moment. Um, so the project really began in 2019, even though the, the official funding didn't start until 2020. In 2019, we had to construct the base herd put through purchases or selective culling of what the department already had. Um, and to just give you an indication of where we selected both bulls and, and heifers across the country, we, we tried to select from as wide a geographical reason as we could. Um, you can see there, we you know, obviously Brahmins up here in the north, but some other breeds as well, all the way down to around Melbourne and Adelaide. Um, we didn't select females from Tasmania or Western Australia. Because yeah, expense was just too much. We we couldn't justify that. But um, you know, we have included genetics from from Western Australia and and Tasmania in terms of the uh, the bull AIs that we've conducted. So it's quite quite wide where we've sourced animal females from to to begin the project. So once we uh, formed that base herd of of cows, um, I just also need to point out that that base herd of cows is not comparable to each other because they all originate from different locations, they're different ages, they've had different experiences, so they're not comparable. It's, it's only their progeny that comparable. So from there, we move forward. We, we AI naturally made those females to produce some calves in 2020. Those cows continued on and they went through another AI and backup process in 2020. Um, from there, this is where we finished the end of last year, 2021. We did our third AI and backup program of the base cows as a whole. They produced another group of progeny, male and female, in the middle of last year, and the ones they produced in 2020 were weaned. The steers have gone into the feedlot. Some are there now. We've still got a few to go in. And the heifers were all mated in the second half of 2021, and we finished preg testing them in January and February at the start of this year. So we know which of those heifers are in calf and which aren't. Um, just to give you a bit of a feel of who's contributed to the project in terms of the genetic diversity we've been able to sample, I've sort of put together a, a bit of a logo snapshot where I can't find logos. I've got the names of the studs that are contributed for, across all the breeds just to show you how widely we've sampled, whether that's cows or AI size or backup bulls. You know, we've, we've tried to 
reach as far and as wide within each breed as we can to make sure that we adequately represent the genetic diversity that's there. That's that's critical to the project, and we've tried really hard to do that. Um, so there's a fair, fair swath of different studs represented in each of the, the breeds, um, and even the Brahmin breed, we've, we've, we've sampled a fair diversity of the, of the studs and, and also been lucky enough to have semen um, provided to us out of the Reprogenomics Project, which gives us direct linkage back into that northern research. Um, so this is where we are or where we were at the start of the year. What we're gearing up to do is wean this year, last year's calves, prepare the cows for calving again this year. Um, those calves that are weaned will go through a backgrounding process and a grow process to be joined. The heifers in September, October, November, and the steers to begin to go into the feedlot around the same period and, and then ultimately be killed to, to record carcass information. In the middle of the year, we'll have our third group of progeny from those base cows. Some of the base cows will stay and produce a fourth group. And as you can see, we'll continue that process of weaning and, and, and pushing the animals through. Um, the base cows have started to exit as of 2020. Some will exit at the end of last year, and a large number will exit this year as cows that are surplus to requirement. Um, the first heifers will carve this year, as you can see, and then each subsequent group of heifers will carve after that, and basically we'll fill in the herd by keeping those females across time until we get to 2025. It becomes quite convoluted out here, but that, that's the basic process that will – that base cow herd will be replaced by their own daughters as time moves along, and, and we introduce new size to the project to, to continue the diversity of representing the different breeds. Um, just to give you a feel of the numbers we're talking about, here's the females that we mated in, in our AI and backup. Our AI program is only dedicated to the cows, so, so these cows up here went through a, an AI program and then a backup program, and there's a total of 1,635. That has dropped down from about 1,800 as we've, we've lost a few cows across time. Our first group of heifers, you can see here, 600 and above 600 of them were naturally mated to bulls at each of the sites. At Grafton, these heifers include the purebred Angus, Hereford and Brahmin, as well as the crossbred heifers for those matings, but the rest of them are just purebred matings across the other sites. I've, I've demonstrated that on a, on a breed basis here. Um, these heifers include the crossbred heifers at, at Grafton, as well as, as well as the purebred Brahmins. Um, bull usage, I've got a snapshot of what we did up to 20, uh, up to including the 2020 mating and then last year's 2021 mating. Probably the number that matters the most is it, we, we'd represent 287 different size up till the finish of mating in 2020. That's now increased to 375 different size across the breeds as of the end of last, last year's mating event which is, is a wide diversity of representation across the breeds. We've, we've sampled pretty well, although there's still a few holes we can fill. We can do that moving forward, but we've been able to represent a large number of size across the breeds. This is just a snapshot, again, of the same picture. Here's our 287, and they're the size that add up here to give that 287 and how they link back into industry herds. They're all industry relevant, relevant size. When we look in this box here, what this is showing in here, there's 94 different sides being used at Trangy, 110 at Grafton, 82 at Tokel, 81 at Glen Ennis, and 157 at Emai. And those numbers um, show, show the diversity at the site. The numbers in the off-diagonal, so 32 between Grafton and Trangy, as you can see the off-diagonal, that's the number of sides that are common between the 110 and the 94. So we've used 32 common size between those two sites, 52 common size between EMA and Trangy, 47 common size between EMAI and Gleninus. And of the 287 size, these numbers here represent how many of them have progeny in these different research projects that are already out there in industry, the beef CRCs, the Reprogenomics Project in the North and the Angus and Hereford bin programs in Southern Australia. So we've got linkage to industry to research herds and across the sites and environments to, to make sure everything is linked together and, and we get the best information across environments and bet between industry and our research herds. Um, 
this is just a snapshot of the calves we've, we've weaned or we are currently weaning, total of 2,700 um, by the time we finish just after Easter this year. You can see it there by site or by breed. Um, a good representation across the breeds and it, it, it's giving us these numbers once we finish weaning starts to give us numbers that we can we can look at in terms of genetic analyses around things like calving ease birth weights weaning traits docility scores things like that so we're starting to get to the point that we can in the next 12 months start to ram up some of the uh, analyses we do and the comparisons we make between breeds um, moving into this year this is a table of the pregnancies we currently have, whether it's between cows and heifers, um, a total of 1,985 females are pregnant. The numbers I got in these boxes are our design numbers, our ideal. So you can see we're getting close to the total number, but you can see for each of the sites, um, some of the numbers are higher, some of them are close to what our targets are. Um, but we just, we, we, what it means we have to do is we have to redistribute some of these cows, like from EMAI, that some of the Wagyus might have to go to Gleninus, some of the Charolais and Shorthorns to Trangy, just to redistribute our numbers and continue to try and target this number of pregnant females a year as we move forward. I've just shown you that again across breeds um, to give us that total of 1,985 total pregnancies in, in the project. Some of these cows, I should say, will actually also leave the project because they've contributed their two progeny minimum and, and we can use them for other research purposes within the department or we can sell them on to other people. So again, Martin, that's probably a good point to uh, let people ask questions if they want to. Thanks, Brad. Uh, um, Happy Brad. Nothing, nothing more come in. Um, Brad, oh, yeah. Just, just one thing I'd just like to add here. The um, with the the, the the size over the dams when they're through the the joining process, are you finding any? Uh, I guess a breeds, you know, sort of selectivity. Like, there's a, is a Brahmin sort of choosing a Brahmin bull, choosing a Brahmin heifer to want to join to? Um, it, or is it? it it's, it's no. <laughs> No, not at all. It's it's more um, around the cow, actually, um, whether she cycles or not. So some of the Brahmins, you know, are a little bit less inclined to cycle. Some of them tend to need to wean the calf before they want to cycle. So it's more around the female. Are the females cycling? The bulls are bulls, Martin. I think I think yeah, they're keen yeah. for anything. So. <laughs> um, it's more around the female. Is she cycling or not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. So there's no no uh, no colour selection criteria there exhibit, exhibited by the bulls. That's good. Yeah. No, that's no. no. If if, um, if the Angus or Hereford cow is cycling, the Brahma bull's happy to mate with her. So. Yeah. Yep. And that, thank you. Thanks, Brad. Continue. No worries. All right. I'll I'll keep going. All right. So we're up to the the last section. Just to to wrap it up a bit, the commercial benefit that could come out of a, a multi breed evaluation if if that was to occur in the future. I put this up earlier. This is where we currently sit. We effectively can't compare across breeds within Australia. Um, what we'd like to do is fill all in, in all those gaps, and then that would allow us to to evaluate profitability across those breeds within a, within a given production system, and we could have different indexes for different production systems. Um, what we also want to do, just to lead through, this is an example of some of the results that come out of um, Reprenovics project in the north. This is stage to calving, the fertility trait and breed plan. And I'm not going to show you exactly what the breeds are, but um, you know we've got the three breeds in that project. And this this bull here on the left hand side, he's actually got the best fertility, the lowest stage to calving EBV. So his daughters are the most fertile. And you go across to this bull on the right, he's actually got the highest stage to calving EBV out of Reprenomics, which means his heifers are the least fertile. And you can see the main characteristic here is that the colours are not clumped. They're, they're basically distributed, which means the old adage of there's as much variation within a breed as there is between the breeds is, is holding here that, you know, Within a breed, there's some really good fertile bulls that can breed fertile daughters, and there's some that are less fertile and breed less fertile daughters. So, you know, it's up to us to, to come up with a good evaluation to be able to select what we want, which is for fertility, we're generally on this side for increased fertility or a lower days to calving EBV. Just to highlight that again, this is the genetic trend in days to calving in Brahman, and to show you the impact that this research can have. So, 
Oh, I've lost my scale, but this is about um, 2010, 11 here. And before that, you can see the Brahmin breed was actually increasing its days to calving, which means it's, it's actually reducing the fertility of the breed. But since the beef CRC and the reprenomics information have started to filter into Brahmins, you can see that there's a dramatic decline in the days to calving EBV, which is actually equivalent to a dramatic increase in fertility across the breed. So the genetic trend in Brahmins is actually increasing for fertility, whereas prior to about 2009, 2010, the genetic trend was decreasing fertility in the Brahmin. So that's just a representation of the impact that research like ours and the reprenomics research in the north can have on a fertility trait like days to calving. Um, so an ideal of what we'd like to do is, you know, include other hard to measure traits, which is our carcass traits, retail beef field and IMF for our main economic traits, things like days to calving to focus on fertility, new traits around fertility like puberty and postpartum anestrus or our, our recycle trait. Um, if they're relevant and, and, and we can in, implement them in brief plan, put them in there. Another trait that's been recorded is our cow body composition trait, which you know our cow body condition score at mating. Again, you can see that the main characteristic here is, you know, there's bulls over here that produce daughters that have a higher level of um, body composition at the point of mating and then there's bulls over here that produce daughters that are at the lower end of the body composition scale and again there's great diversity within and between the breeds so you know it's it's up to us con to construct a, a system in breed plan where we can have that as a trait that we can select for increased body condition if it's relevant or maybe it's relevant to sleep for decreased body composition depends on the production system we're in but including new traits like that also our horn pole traits or our methane. This is a methane measurement device here called a green feeder that will be used in the project and in, and in northern projects coming. Um, and, and include them into our genetic evaluation so we can do our hard to measure traits, our fertility traits, our new economic traits, whether it's feed efficiency, cow composition, methane, or a resilience trait like worm egg count. And then give us a future index that includes all these economic traits in one index within a production system to tell us how the different breeds would affect profitability in that system. Um, another one we could do with the right information moving forward is we could create a better systematic process for, for taking advantage of crossbreeding. These two articles here were produced in 1984. They're the only real active crossbreeding information produced from Australian research. Um, that was conducted at Grafton when they did Brahman and Hereford and other, other crossbreeding systems down in Grafton in the 60s, 70s and early 80s. We haven't produced anything new in Australia for that and hopefully we can uh, base any new crossbreeding information we can provide on the information recording in Southern Multibreed and allow people to hopefully construct some, some quite effective crosses and take advantage of that hybrid vigour effect for, for economic gain. Um, so just to summarise, the presentation there is, as I said at the, the start, we've got some, some key intents. We want to record data in a crossbreed head-to-head situation to underpin any potential developments in multi-breed evaluation within breed plan. We want to use that resource to collect both high-quality, hard-to-measure and new traits like our immune competence or our, our WEC scores. But we also want to DNA sample all those animals to give us a genomic resource that we can compare those new traits across the breeds with. Also, you know, there's the commercial benefit if we if we can do all this and create a system to allow us to capture crossbreeding advantages, that'd be fantastic. And um, importantly, not compromise our, our straight breeding programs that, where they're important. And also implement new commercially relevant traits that help us in the future and, and help us focus on future production. Um, if there's a question there, Martin, that'd be useful. And I've just got a couple of slides to finish up after that. Brad, um, uh, again, um, I've just got one I'd just like to ask is with the breeds, um, being a yep. boy from southern New South Wales, where's the, the good old Murray Gray? What are they doing? <laughs> What's the opportunity with them? <laughs> um, so Murray Gray is a what we call a stabilised composite. So it's sort of a brood of its own, even though it's a, a cross between Shorthorns and Angus. Um, one of the things we have to do once we get all this data together is evaluate 
how we can deal with those those sorts of breeds. We might be able to just augment Murray Gray straight into a multi-breed evaluation um, if it's appropriate from the data without actually having to record a lot of information on them because because that we know their background is Angus and Shorthorn. If we've got the genomics for Angus and Shorthorn, we've got the data recorder for Angus and Shorthorn and we do a bit of crossbreeding with Angus and Shorthorn moving in the future, that might put us in a position that we can bring in something like a Murray Gray without much effort on that breed's behalf. Um, you know, the same the same might happen with something like a Santa Gertrudis or something, but we don't know that yet. We've got to do more work on on multi breed genomics in this building and how we implement it into a, a breed plan evaluation so that we capture all the advantage of of genomics along with the data that's recorded in both Southern Multi Breed and the Reaponomics project. Yeah, as I say, and one of the one of the um, uh, sort of traits I, I, I feel sort of stands out from what you mentioned so far is the the, the benefit of the uh, repro onyx, um, uh, Brad. Yeah, just that sounds like yeah. it'll be a wealth of information that'll help provide. Yep, and it's it's doing it already because they're already feeding um, that information back to the respective breeds so that that can be used within the breed evaluations we currently have. And that's a lot of that change you saw in the Brahman days, the calving EBV is coming from that sort of thing. Uh, we're not at that stage yet because we don't have enough data to give back to the breeds to put into their evaluations yet. Um, but that's something we hopefully would like to replicate a similar impact to what Reaponomics is having with those three northern breeds. It'd be really good if we could get that to happen. Yeah, so in a few years, time, certainly you know, on top of what the breed plan you know, is doing, yeah, that there's a little yep. speed. Yeah, magnificent advocate for that as well. Yeah, in, in addition. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Brad. Uh, no, I don't think there's anything else at the present time. Uh, all right. Yeah. Well, I'll just we'll finish up with a couple of slides, yeah. if that's all right. There's, there's only a couple here. Yeah. I thought I'd just um, put in a, a point here to let everyone have a look at what we deal with. That's um, our Grafton-based heifers. So we have Hereford, Angus, Brahman, and our Brahman, Angus, Hereford, Angus, uh, Hereford, Brahman, sorry, cross heifers. Uh, after they finished preg testing, they're sitting there, the bulls are mixed in there amongst them. They had to um, wait in the house yard right next to Ballina. This research site is, is on the Richmond River right at the doorstep of Ballina when these floods occurred. You can see that they're in the house yard there. That's the, the highest point on the property. Um, there's another aerial view of what it looked like. The beach is out this way from there. That's the house that we're looking at in the other photo. This is the cattle yards. You can see here they were they were uninundated. All that there's some sugarcane crops in the north coast there. This is our TO Renee. She works exclusively on the project, and uh, you can see um, her walking around the farm there, up to, up to a up to a waist in water. Uh, this is the heifers after they got them off here. The Pacific highways in this photo to the to the west this way. So this is the, the heifers and the bulls being walked back up the specific highway so that they could be loaded onto trucks and uh, moved back onto high ground back back close to the Wollumbar. There they are there back on the high ground there. They look a bit happier. Those heifers had to spend at least 12 hours standing in 80 centimetres of water. Um, we were lucky to get out of it with, with no losses, uh, a few cuts on the legs, but no major issues with them thus far, and we're working hard to keep their pregnancies and keep them from uh, any trauma to a minimum that they suffered through that that flooding event. But the team did an excellent job up on the north coast to uh, ensure we kept all those heifers in the project and we didn't lose all that hard effort. Um, so with that, I need to, I'm obliged to acknowledge all the people that contribute to a project of this scale. You know, there's my, my fellow uh, um, scientists to help put the project together and run it. There's also a lot of other research scientists from DPI, University of New England, here in Agbu and CSIRO, and in particular David Johnston, who runs the Reaponomics project in the north. His, his oversight and input into our projects being next to none, like it's, it's completely invaluable and, and we wouldn't have been able to do it without his input. We, we have to thank the management and staff at all the sites, um, whether they're DPI sites or UNE feedlot, you know, all staff work together and, and have to do it in, in a highly constructed way to, to be effective in the outcome, being what we need. Um, we've got our technical staff, such as Renee and others there that work for us and, and with our research partner, Syro. And we've also got commercial partners like AOA technicians, DNA companies, merchandise agencies, the breeders themselves, breed societies and producers that also work with us in this space. So. 
I need to acknowledge all those people because a project of this scale doesn't happen without a, a large team that work together and, and I need to acknowledge that. So thank you, Martin. That's that's all I've got for the audience. If there's any other questions from here. Uh, thank you, Brad. And again, a, 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 um, a bigger thank you uh, yeah, to to yourself and the team, effectively. Uh, yeah, the, and, yeah, all the acknowledgements you've just uh, announced there. Yeah, all well deserving by the sound of it, because it yeah, it sounds like a great project. Do what one um, number three or two and a half three years to go, by the way. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, three years yeah. from the middle of this year through, so three and a half. I've, I've actually got a link there to the Southern Multibreed um, Project website. I, I forgot to put it up. I'll, I'll forward it to you, Martin, if I haven't already, so that you can share it with your audience and with the group, and, and they can just go to that website. Periodically, we'll be putting updates there and photos and various things for people to look at and see what's going on in the project. So I'll, I'll make sure you get that in the very near future so you can share that, share that with the wider audience. Uh, that'll be fantastic. Look forward to that. We can uh, we can send that out. Um, so thank you, Brad. Um, and just to uh, finish and close, yeah, just to thank you for all the attendees um, that have um, been able to join us today. Um, and again, so this is the second of a series of three. And there's one more uh, tonight, as I say, and hopefully, again, I just want to make an apology because we were supposed to have Brad on last Wednesday, the, uh, the 16th of um, uh, on, on the 16th of March, uh, between 7:30 and 8:30 p.m. Due to um, uh, some health problems that I experienced at the time, yeah, we just had to cancel that and postpone it and, and reschedule it for uh, today here at lunchtime. So thanks for making the effort to join. But we've still got one more event uh, tonight between 7.30 to 8.30, which is the production and breeding in southern New South Wales. Managing bulls to ensure the genetics work, um, which will be presented by Dr. Shane Thompson from the uh, Holbrook uh, Veterinary Centre. So again, thank you again uh, for making the effort to attend. And Brad, thank you for your uh, for your presentation and, and um, research there. That's been yeah, some fantastic ideas coming out. No worries, so Martin. Again, I should also uh, sorry. Uh, I, <laughs> in yeah. all my acknowledgements, I actually forgot to acknowledge Shane. So he's actually our project vet. He, him and the Holbrook Vet Centre provide us with a very good service, particularly around preg testing and doing the ovarian scanning of our, our heifers and our, our cows, as well as other veterinary advice. And Shane's a really good vet from our end. Um, he does a fantastic job in supporting our project and providing us with a great service. So he wasn't actually on that slide, but I should actually acknowledge them specifically too. No, Shane, did tell me he was doing a fair bit with you. And uh, just for my own probably information more than anything, um, uh, Brad, it's, they call it the Southern Multibreed Project, but it sort of seems to be anything south of Rockhampton to probably about Tamworth. It's, uh, um, yeah. when, when are we going to get down to the Riverina? <laughs> Uh, you mean no. site-wise? Well, yeah. I'm, I'm constrained by where we have research sites, Martin, so... I can't tell them where to put research sites, so we, that, that's what we've got available to us for beef, so that's what we use. Um, hopefully, Trangy is pretty close to representing the Riverina. Um, EMAI hopefully does represent something of the southern highlands, but unfortunately, I don't own the land. I can't determine where it is. I've just got to use what I've got. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you again. And anyway, so no, thanks, uh, participants. So we might uh, call this a close now. And again, the um, webinar has been recorded. Will be available on on the as you see on the slide here. Will be available on the Riverina uh, Local Land Services website under the um, article plans and publications uh, tab. And again, there's the uh, link there to uh, to tonight's um, uh, webinar with uh, Dr. Shane Thompson. If you haven't already uh, uh, registered to attend that. So thanks again, and uh, good afternoon. Bye.